A nice, cool morning in August. I hope you've had a, a good week and ready to start another great week. Thank you for attending this morning. Uh, I have announced this morning uh, <clears throat> prayer requests. Uh, uh, Donna Phillips is Sherry Brady's sister. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, and also Bonnie Lathy's brother, Dean England. All right. Hi, <clears throat> Graf's niece, Barb Pugh, and Walt. Walt's going to have some surgery. And uh, Bonnie, uh, oh, yeah, Steve. Steve. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, and uh, if you still haven't signed up for Bonnie Lathy's yard, uh, please do so. Uh, we have somebody this week, but uh, we need to help her out with that because uh, she hasn't been getting get mowed this summer. Uh, please help back with that. Um, so remember those in your prayer, Walt, uh, Dean, and Donna. Uh, we also, again, want to congratulate Ashley Smith for becoming the new child in Christ last Sunday. We think that's awesome. We praise God for that. Um, and I don't know. I, <laughs> Lloyd and Rhonda have moved their crew down to Waverly now. I don't know why they want to move to Waverly, but they did. <laughs> so uh, keep them in your mind, your prayers, and unfriend them from Facebook because they left us. All right, not just kidding. All right, so an important announcement here from Cammy Ash. Uh, we went, she has salsa today. Three salsa. It says, keep it refrigerated. The blue label is medium. The no label is mild. And she liked the jars and lids returned. So if you're a salsa fan and you don't like hot salsa, this is, this is your turn. Okay, I thank you for being here today. And as we, uh, and I thought I got this guy, this I just told somebody, I guess, Come up with these one liners. So you got, you know, with the pandemic, you know, everybody's eating out. And you get in line at McDonald's, it's so long. Time you get through, you got to get in line again because you're hungry again. <laughs> if you've been to McDonald's, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, let's have a start with a, uh, our service with a, a prayer this morning. Our Father, we are so thankful today that uh, you've brought us here on this beautiful morning. You bless us so much that sometimes in our daily lives we get wrapped up and we can't see what you've given to us of all the uh, things around us, things that we don't see, that you take care of us, that just like the birds and the fields and the flowers, it's, you know, you take care of us, and we're thankful for that care and your love you have for us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are with us daily, and we thank you that you're with us today as we worship you. May we lift our voices to praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. And I worship, lift, lift your name, and also lift each one of us up for this week. We thank you, Lord, for uh, Christ the King, and we thank you for the Spirit that guides us, fill us, fulfill us, give us life, give us love, give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen. to address it for us short people. Good morning, family. Beautiful morning this morning. <clears throat> We're going to start off with two songs before the Lord's Supper. The first one is going to be the Glory Land Way, or if you're using the app, it'll just be Glory Land Way. And if you're able, can you please stand with me for this first song? <clears throat> if you're using your book, it's going to be number 297. And the song following this will be Come Share the Lord, which is not in a book, so <clears throat> I think we, hopefully we should know that. <clears throat> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for 
I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Maybe see. Our next song will be the song before the communion. <clears throat> I know I sing this a lot, but I'm song leading, so I get the choice. <laughs> <clears throat> the reason I like this song so much is it reminds us that we're all family, no matter where we're at. We're all in the body. When we partake of this, we're all coming together. <clears throat> so as we sing this, please try to keep that in your hearts and minds. Try to think about that. <clears throat> we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here. We in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is hand. Though unseen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. As we remember Christ's life and his death on the cross and resurrection as we take of this communion together, I want us to also remember our hope as Christians because of what he did for us. Um, we hope as Christians that we will also be resurrected just like our, our Lord. So in I want to read from Philippians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we are eagerly waiting for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. By his power to rule all things, he will change our humble bodies and make them like his own glorious body. I think that's amazing that not only do we 
get to have the hope of heaven, but we also get to have the hope that, I mean, our bodies are going to be like Christ's bodies. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So as we share this uh, communion and we think about Jesus, let us also think about how, you know, we have the hope of heaven and that we will be like Christ. Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son, for the blessing that we can be your children, that we can call you father. We think now of how Christ was born like us, how he became human and that he showed us how to live and was willing to die on the cross for us. As we take of this bread, help us to remember him and help us to remember um, our commitment to being like him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, we continue to remember Christ and his sacrifice for us, his blood that was shed for us. The only thing that could cleanse us from sin. We are so thankful that we can be pure and holy in your sight. We also thank you that we can remember him now together as a family as we take of this fruit of the vine we also are excited for heaven help us to remember that as we go throughout our week this week that we wouldn't let the things of this you know the this life the day-to-day -day grind that we wouldn't let it distract us or um Help us to keep our mindset on things above. We thank you again for Jesus. In his name, amen. Next song will be Ancient Words, not in the book. It's in the Ministry League app if you would like to look in there. <clears throat> this will also be the song before our prayer that will lead into our, our lesson. <clears throat> Ancient Words. <clears throat> Holy words, long preserved. From our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of light, words of hope. Give us strength, help us go in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our 
our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart Thanks, Landon, for those words. Uh, isn't it great to think that someday we'll have a body like Jesus? Amen. We'll live forever with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we'll be so thankful to be able to call you our Father, be able to talk to you and call upon you, praising your name, how great you are that you are our Father, and that someday we will leave this world and be in your world with you. We thank you for that hope. Pray that as we go through the, the trials of the, the times that we have right now, that we'll keep that hope in front of us. We pray for your healing for our land. We pray for uh, deliverance from the virus. We pray that whatever means that you see fit to use, that, that we will be delivered from that. We pray for the turmoil in our country, that there will be an end to that, that there will be peace in our land, that we will learn to love one another and to be the type of people that you want us to be, to be, to be Christians, to be followers of yours. We pray for those that are suffering at this time and for those that are going to have surgeries. We ask a special blessing on them, bless our shut-ins, help, help us to encourage them all that we can. And as we go through this service, help us to learn from your word and to be encouraged by your word and to live by your word. In your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Confess, I don't always hear the announcements because I, uh, my mind is going several different directions as we begin worship. So if uh, Don mentioned this, I apologize for the repeat, but I guess we learn sometimes by repeat. But next Sunday, we're going to take some time and pray for teachers and students in our schools. Uh, if you want to invite people that work in settings or, or fellow students, come and be a part of that. We'd love to have them here as well, but um, we want to take special time and, and do that next Lord's Day. This is the 15th week that we have uh, had camp church, as one of our little ones called it a few weeks ago. Uh, she said she loves camp church, I guess because of the chairs, maybe, or maybe the shorts. I don't know what it is, but uh, whatever it is, it's great. You know, some of our of our brothers and sisters and other churches have yet to meet together in in real setting like this, uh, which is pretty incredible if you think about it, since March. And we're we're blessed to be able to do this. And uh, 
one thing I've noticed in the last few weeks is is several different places saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna get together in our parking lot and and worship this coming week." So you're trendsetters, and that's good as long as it's good trend. You ever draw a picture of God? There's a little boy that was working very hard on a drawing. And his dad asked him what he was doing. The son said, drawing a picture of God. And his dad said, well, I'm not sure you can do that, honey. Nobody knows what God looks like. But the little boy was undeterred. He continued to draw. And, and finally, he looked at his picture with satisfaction. He said, very matter-of-factly, they will in a few minutes. Well, our, our lesson today really contains a picture of God that was drawn by a prophet named Ezekiel. Ezekiel was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. He was exiled from the land of Israel along with thousands of others in about 597 B.C. And so he was preaching in a foreign land and, and he did that for many years and brought God's message to God's people in that land. One day when he was about 30 years old, while he was in the land of Babylon, he was given a vision of God. This is in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. He says in chapter 1, verse 1, The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And in the rest of that opening chapter of Ezekiel, he, in a sense, draws a picture of God. He tries to give us some sense of what he saw. And it, it was an incredible, impressive vision. And he uses word pictures, similes, and analogies to try and describe what he saw. And so you're going to hear the word like a lot and the phrase it had the appearance of or looked like or had the form of Ezekiel is trying to describe what is really indescribable and it sort of sounds like it as he does so and this vision is a little tough to understand sometimes a bit hard to follow I'm taking a bit of a risk here this morning in sharing this and, and reading parts of this to you because if you're not locked in, I could lose you, okay? I'm going to ask you to lock in for a few minutes uh, and not be lost in the details of this because it's actually something really important. I'm going to try and simplify it a bit and draw our lessons from it, but I'm just encouraging you to follow along in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. So this is what Ezekiel sees when he's invited into the presence of God. First of all, and this shouldn't be too hard to imagine, uh, a huge imposing storm. Okay? So we have had several pretty hard rainstorms recently, and and probably watched a hurricane on TV recently. So think of a really big storm. Chapter 1, verse 4 of Ezekiel says, As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. One thing we're going to see in this vision is he, he names, talks about burning metal and, and different kinds of stones and so forth. Just sort of keep in mind, bright, shiny, uh, impressive kind of images. So he sees this huge storm system coming from the north and, and lightning flashing out of it all the way as it comes and, and it looks like fire. And the light sort of glows like burning metal. That, that would get my attention, wouldn't it? 
Wouldn't you? You saw that coming at you from the north? So the vision starts with a storm. That's part one. And then comes some strange creatures. As the storm gets closer, they begin to emerge from the storm. This is part two. I'm going to read a few verses here, beginning in verse five. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightnings. The living creatures darted to and fro, like the appearance of a flash of lightning. So part of what Ezekiel sees here is what is described in several other places in the Bible as cherubim. Now, down through the centuries, artists, especially Renaissance period artists, depicted cherubim as these cute, little, cuddly, rosy-faced, pudgy children with little dinky wings. I don't know where in the world they ever got that picture. <coughs> Certainly, they didn't get it from the Bible. Because cherubs in the Bible are fearsome, awe-inspiring creatures. No one would look at them and say, cute, cuddly. <laughs> that would never come to mind, you see. We first run into cherubs back in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 24, they're mentioned. Remember Adam and Eve? They're banished from the Garden of Eden. And remember what God did? He, he placed cute little rosy-faced pudgy children at the entrance of the garden, right? Not right? No, it isn't right. He put cherubim there. And he gave them flaming swords, and they were to guard the entrance and make sure no one ever came back in to that place. We find them again in Exodus chapters 36 and 37 as the tabernacle is described. There were pictures of cherubim woven into the tapestry of the veil of the tabernacle, the veil that separated from God's presence, you see, was guarded by cherubim in the tapestry. They were also fashioned two cherubim and placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant and their wings stretched out over the top and touched. Notice in the vision that Ezekiel sees these, the wings of these creatures are touching. And then if you jump to the end of Scripture, to the book of Revelation chapter 4, there are very similar sounding creatures described there and they're said to to, th to surround the throne of god and that they're there worshiping god continually 
These are meant to be impressive. They are meant to de depict power and majesty and glory uh, because they're associated with God. They're always close to God, you see. Now, part three of the vision. Years ago, in the congregation I grew up in, there was a song that we sang that had the following words that spoke of God. It said, he's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Makes no difference what men say. I'm going to love him anyway. He's my rock, my sword, my shield. Praise the Lord. Anybody know that song? There's a few. Well, I understood all the words to that song, even as a young person, except for that one reference. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. I didn't know what that was about. I just sang it. But it's taken from right here in Ezekiel chapter 1. Reading on, verse 15. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside them, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same likeness their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. So, Ezekiel has described a storm that he saw, the four living creatures that emerged from the storm, and they appear now to be riding on wheels actually wheels within wheels and the wheels have eyes you creeped out yet and all of it this whole thing is animated and given power by the spirit the spirit of god well in some sense what you have described here by ezekiel sounds like a chariot Think of a chariot, a bright, flaming, awe-inspiring chariot. But the thing about a chariot is, a chariot needs a rider. And that's the final part of the vision. Verses 22 through 25 describes this platform. Some translations say an expanse, a platform up above the four living creatures and above these incredible wheels that apparently can see everything. There's this platform. And this whole thing, this, this chariot is making noise, a lot of noise. The prophet describes the noise in three different ways just to make sure that we get the impression. He says, the noise was like the sound of many waters rushing water and then he says it's like the sound of the almighty which is reference to god then he says it's like the sound of an army so you pick which one of those communicates to you maybe all of them but this thing is making noise so Ezekiel's not only seeing things, he is hearing things. And then he hears something else, something that manages to come through all that noise from the chariot. And it's a voice. It's the voice of the one riding the chariot. 
chariot has to have a rider. The rider of this chariot is God. And that's the final part of the vision. Verse 26. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. So, how do you describe God on his throne? Well, this is how Ezekiel describes it. The being that he saw had the appearance of a man, a human, except that he glowed like burning metal and, and there's this brightness all around him, almost as if he's surrounded by a rainbow. And then really, here is the key verse, the last part of verse 28 that we didn't read. It says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. So has Ezekiel drawn us an exact picture of God? No. We couldn't handle an exact picture of God. We would explode. We can't comprehend the presence of God. But he's tried to describe the indescribable, and he gives us images and likenesses and things to think about he realized without a doubt that he was in God's presence, that he had been welcomed in to the presence of God, and he did what every person does when they come face to face with the creator of the universe. He fell on his face before him. I want to offer a couple of things that we learn from Ezekiel's visit to God's presence. First of all, and I know this probably seems too simplistic and maybe almost trite to say, but I don't know how, how to say it better. Our God is an awesome God. That's got to be one of the main things that the prophet took away from this, and really we should too. And I know that in our day and time, and it's been, been this way for years now, we, we tend to emphasize being close to God and, and having a personal relationship with God. And we like to think about God as our friend and that kind of thing. And I'm certainly not trying to throw away those pictures of God today, but we need to remember that our God is awesome. First of all, he is not like us. He is above us. He is wholly other than us. And when we come into his presence one day, we will fall on our face. We will bow our knee before him. Now, he won't let us stay there. If you read on the next couple of chapters, the Spirit enters into Ezekiel and gives Ezekiel the strength to stand in God's presence. But God's the one that makes that possible, not Ezekiel. It's not like Ezekiel suddenly got strong enough to stand. 
God gives him the power to do so. Another thing to draw from this is that this awesome God is awesome and powerful everywhere. Remember where this vision takes place, that's easy to forget. It's in Babylon. The prophet's in exile with God's people. Babylon's the most powerful nation on earth at the time. When God's people were defeated by the Babylonian armies, they were carried away and, and they were marched through the gates and the streets of, of Babylon past the temples of all the so-called gods of Babylon. And, and through the gates of the city that we know were inscribed with pictures of these gods. You wonder what the people thought as they were marched through. Were they thinking that their God, that the Lord had failed them? That the gods of Babylon that they were surrounded by, at least images of, that they must have been superior, stronger, more awesome. But this vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 shows that the Lord God, Yahweh God, is powerful everywhere, especially in Babylon. He comes to Babylon riding on storm clouds. He comes on a fiery war chariot. No one can stop him. He moves back and forth at will and in great power. What's the message? God is powerful everywhere. He is not limited to Israel to Jerusalem. He's not locked up in a temple and have we not learned this year that he is not contained in a church building on Sunday. And you pick the most what you would describe as the most God-forsaken place you can think of on earth, the most wicked place, whatever, however you think of it, God can go there in power. He is not denied any space. And finally, from this vision of Ezekiel's, we learn that when, when God shows up like this, when he appears on the scene, there is a reason. He has a purpose. God is not out just to get people to bow down to him, to, to, to put on a show, to just impress. You know, if that were the case, we would expect to see these kinds of visions and appearances all the time. Maybe we get the impression that Jesus, every moment that he was on earth, did miracles. But remember, people were begging him to do signs. He normally didn't. God didn't do this all the time. When he does, there's a purpose, and he has a message for Ezekiel. He wanted the prophet to listen. You go on and read chapters 2 and 3 later on and see what he had in mind for Ezekiel. Just briefly stated, he wanted Ezekiel to become his mouthpiece to the people. He says... He says to Ezekiel, I want you to speak what I say, and I'm telling you in advance, they're not going to listen. But he still wanted him to speak. And he says in chapter 2, verse 5, that even though they don't listen, at the very least they will know that there has been a prophet among them. 
And, and I'm convinced that God wants us to be like Him. In this sense, ju just like the Lord can go anywhere and, and will go anywhere with His awesome presence, He wants us, His people, to speak His words and His truth anywhere and everywhere. Whether people are listening or not. He wants people who will stand up for Him. He wants His people to be His mouthpieces still today. And He wants, he wants people to do that in far more places than just here. He needs people to do that at your place of work and in your school and at the ball game and every place else. And I'm sure that all those can really be tough places to be God's mouthpiece at times. It may well seem at times that God has abandoned some, some of those places. And that we don't dare speak his name in those places. But that's what Ezekiel thought. Until God showed up one day in Babylon. It's a privilege to, to speak for him. And it's good to know just a little bit of what God looks like. It's an amazing chapter. And the first three or four chapters of Ezekiel go on like this. I encourage you to study it, think about it on your own. Let's pray. Holy and great God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence with us. We, we know your promise that we're just a few are gathered, you are there. And we also know that you will go where we will be your mouthpiece. Help us to have the courage to do so. We pray in Christ. Amen. Our song before the closing prayer will be, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. It's number 311 in your books, 311. You want to use those? <clears throat> if you're using the Mystery League app, it's just My Hope is Built. And if you're able, can you please stand with me for this last song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds me in the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found.
Rest in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated. This time I'll be led in the closing prayer. Uh, before, uh, excuse me, before we have our closing prayer, uh, I'd like to remind you about September 6th, like Mark said. Uh, say this announcement to the end, so you remember. And like, if you're like me, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, September 6th. Uh, everybody, I know parents and grandparents, you know, your grandkids go to school, your kids go to school, you know a, a teacher. You know your teachers, probably, in summer, like Amanda, Fairfield, you probably know them personally almost so ask them to come next week tell them about our prayer day on september 6th invite them tell them we're praying for them and also the students don't forget our students and the staff and uh, just remember invite send an email send, if your child is going to school send, take send them a note with them if they're virtually going to school just stick your head in front of the camera and say hey this is what we're doing so just try to remember to do that. Okay, so let's have our closing prayer now. Bow with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, gorgeous day. We have to come out and be in your presence and worship you. We're thankful for your greatness and your awesomeness that we've heard about today. And we're humbled by the fact that you would want us to worship you and spend eternity with you. Again, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here. We pray for those who could not be here this morning that they may have been with us in spirit. We ask a remembrance at this time of Donna Phillips, of Dean England, of Winnie German, of Willard Hartman, and Walt, as they were mentioned this morning as meeting prayer. Pray that a measure of your peace would be granted unto them. We also thank you for the one who came forward last week, Ashley Smith, to join our number. We're thankful for her and we pray that you give her a good and long and fruitful life and service in your kingdom. We ask you to be with us now as we go about our way, as we begin a new week, whether we be at work, whether we be at school, whether we be at play, or whether we be at home, that we do your will and that you are seen in us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your sacrifice of Jesus for us. Again, be with us now. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.